happy to introduce our eminent panel. Ajanta Chatterjee, Group Head, Talent and OD, JSW Group. She is a talent and LOD specialist with over 20 years working across industries like banking, telecom, and currently she's in the manufacturing sector with JSW Group. She also spearheads the DNI agenda for JSW with focus on building careers for women at the workplace. Ajanta is also part of the IDF Task Force for Women in Leadership. Minakshi Samant, who's the Executive Director, HR Ingram Micro. She has 25 years of diverse experience and has worked across domains of healthcare, manufacturing, chemicals, and medical devices. She currently leads the SARC region for Ingram Micro as the Executive Director HR, and she's also a member of the IDF Task Force on the DNI Toolkit. Pallavi Vaman, Senior Director Engineering, Duck Creek Technologies. Pallavi has diverse experience over 19 years in the PNC insurance industry and capability development across US, UK, and the Asia Pacific. She's currently the engineering lead for Duck Creek Technologies and our only technocrat on this panel. In addition to her engineering role, Pallavi leads the Women's Resource Group in India as a co-chair over the past several years and has made a significant contribution to diversity and inclusion initiatives across the organization. Poonam Chandok, uh, General Manager and Head HR, l and Energy Hydrocarbon. Poonam has had an interesting career path across three decades and driven organizational change, managed post-demerger turbulence, and led strategic interventions as HR head for different divisions of l and Group. She currently leads HR at l and Energy as the GM and HR head of l and Energy Hydrocarbon, one of the biggest businesses within l and She also leads the CSR of l and Energy Hydrocarbon. And last but not the least, Rajni Atreya, Senior Director HR, Insights Division, South Asia, Kantar. In a career spanning 30 years, Rajni has made a planned transition from financial services to HR. She's currently group head HR, uh, Kantar Insights, South Asia, and the country HR services leader for the Kantar group. She's a seasoned HR leader with 30 years of industry experience across banking, securities, information services, technology, and market research. She's also on the board of Kantar India Foundation and part of the IDF Task Force for Women Back to Work. Welcome you all and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Now we dive into the survey questions. What we have done at IDF is that we've looked at the cross-sectional data and the analysis and we've identified a few questions where we wanted industry feedback and their views and at the end of it, We'll also have an audience interaction, so keep your pen and paper ready and give us your suggestions and questions. So we start with the first area that we want to explore a little more, which is DNI policy and the gaps. The IDF survey reveals a strong positive correlation between diversity and business performance, between 91 to 73%, which is an enthusiastic positive response. However, less than half of the companies surveyed, which is only 41%, have a comprehensive DNI so, uh, strategy and policy today on the ground. And those that have strategies experience implementation gaps. In your view, Ajanta, my first question, what should companies do to actualize a comprehensive DNI strategy? So um, I think, uh, you know, if we start uh, with asking ourselves a few questions, uh, starting with who is setting the DNI strategy, right? And here, uh, I want to focus on the DNI maturity model. Are we in the transition point where uh, it is shifting from HR and DNI lead to the business leaders? Are the business leaders involved in setting the DNI strategy? So once we ask that question to ourselves, then I think the next question that we should ask ourselves uh, that um, along with the DNI strategy, are we also setting the cultural strategy? And the cultural strategy would mean that are we role modeling in inclusion? Uh, do we have uh, the senior leaders represent diversely, cognitively as well as demographically? Uh, are all our senior leaders male? <laughs> or uh, do we also have a diverse representation there? And that is all about role modeling. The third point, um, you know, I've noted down these points uh, before coming here, uh, that um, 
Are my business goals strategy reflects DNI, or uh, and are we thinking inclusion while uh, thinking business strategy? Because DNI strategy cannot be, uh, you know, kind of segregated uh, on its own. It has to be completely integrated with the business strategy. And uh, hence, is there a shared purpose? Uh, do I have a demographically and cognitively uh, diverse workforce? If I put it back into man manufacturing, the answer is no. Most of us struggle with a five to six percent of women employees, and I'm only talking about women employees at this point of time. And um, does the external brand uh, match the internal one? And it is not about one day women's day branding. <laughs> Are we moving beyond that? And the fourth one, if we have an employee value proposition, is it set on the, are they set on the pillars of diversity? And then hence, the few questions that we need to ask is structure, policy, processes, and systems. So four things if you keep in mind, and the first key one is who is setting the diversity strategy for us. I think implementation won't be a problem thereafter. Who sets the bar? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, next question to you, Rajni. What are the three steps you suggest to reduce the implementation gap once a strategy is in place? Okay. Um, first of all, hi, everybody. Pleasure to be here and pleasure to see such a mixed group. Um, so that itself is really heartwarming. So thank you for being there. I got stuck in traffic massively just outside the hotel. Uh, so I think everybody who's been here today has spent good time uh, in terms of coming here. So thank you once again for that as well. Um, so in terms of implementation, um, I think I will draw back to what Ajanta said first in terms of who's setting the strategy and how relevant it is and how integrated it is into the business, right? The first point for us is a DEI strategy cannot be delinked from business. It has to be an integral part of the business strategy. And Therefore, how are we embedding it in the business strategy is the fundamental piece. And there is enough evidence and enough research reports which say, which substantiate why diversity is directly linked to business outcomes. I was reading a Forbes article, there is a Peterson uh, University research which says that there are quantified values which says that organizations which have 30% or more women leaders at the top actually have 6% more in terms of revenue and performance outcomes. So it's quantified. So therefore, how are we able to bring in this conversation into the business and into within our stakeholder uh, groups to be able to embed it, embed the DEI strategy as a business strategy? That is step number one, in my opinion. Step number two is, how are we kind of engaging the stakeholders? Stakeholders, not necessarily the leaders, and it should not necessarily be seen as a top-down um, strategy or an approach which is mandated. How do you get the involvement of the entire organization? How do you drive conversations um, that ensure that it is critical for the organization, that there is, it's a business prerogative, it's a business imperative, and how do you celebrate that kind of coming together of the stakeholder group? Third, last but not the least, Metrics. Mm. Anything that, that does not get measured does not get done. Not get done. So mm. what is the kind of metrics that we are putting in place uh, will define what it is. For example, in our organization, Cantar, our annual engagement survey measures, has three specific questions on inclusion, how included, and that's one. I mean, so every employee has an opportunity to express how they feel and provide feedback. Number two, we have something called the inclusion index, where we measure, it's a numeric index, which we are a research and market consultancy organization, so we're very high on research. So, so there is, a, on survey, so there is a specific inclusion index which quantifies the presence of inclusion and absence of discrimination that we do in Cantar. Other than, of course, the metrics that I'm sure all organizations are doing, everybody is interested, which is a, which is a positive change. So, those are my first cut thoughts. Embed, own, and measure. Now we come to the next uh, big segment that we identified, which is talent retention. The DNI survey, feedback from members, and IDF research shows that hiring talent may be the comparatively easier part of the DNI strategy, though it is not easy by any measure, which I am sure I, I see a lot of nodding heads. But the real <laughs> challenge occurs when the rubber hits the road, when there is a sense of belonging and support 
for the diversity hires to progress along my meaningful career paths. Question to you, Poonam. How do you attract and nurture diverse talent to retain them and give space to develop a meaningful career path? So for LNT, uh, uh, I really resonate with everything that you said. It was like the checklist. I was taking the tech, uh, uh, boxes of how we went about doing it in LNT. Uh, what we first did it is everybody was willing, but nobody knew how. You know, they were not. They were struggling with how are we going to do it. So we came up with a charter, and the charter is there on our website. If anybody wants to refer to, and I think that's the critical part of we we told people how it can be done. The charter has four pillars. The first pillar is induct. So when we say induct, it's not only about recruitment. It is also, uh, you mentioned about engaging the organization. So what we do is we are constantly pushing our managers to tell us new roles where they would like to take women. Right. You know, So they give us the roles. We do the recruitment process. We give it to them. So the ownership of making those women succeed is theirs. Yeah. So we keep multiplying the number of roles where women are getting tried. Uh, then, of course, we have, uh, you know, uh, we, we do these women drives and we have so many things around the pillar of induct. So we are, we are telling the HR heads of various uh, businesses saying that think of how you're going to induct and, uh, you know, apply your strategies, give your numbers, give your targets and measure yourself. The second and most important thing is engage. How do you keep them engaged in an organization? And here it is where sensitivity becomes a very big part of it. So we are doing massive workshops on sensitivity. And we went about it, uh, I don't know differently or not, but uh, what we did is we, we had, con so we have four pillars for, uh, we have four uh, thrust areas for diversity. It's gender, generation, uh, people with disabilities, and now cultural integration that has just been added. Okay, because we are have, going to have massive presence in uh, some of the, uh, countries outside India, so it's about cultural integration because <coughs> from being 5% of uh, local people over there, we have to move to 95%. So four, uh, four things that we need to focus on. So what we said is we went and spoke to people of these groups and said that what are the challenges you face in inclusion and around those challenges we made uh, case studies and we used theatre methodology. Uh, half day sessions based on theatre methodology where we gave half of the case study told the group to enact it without speaking and complete the story. And that, and then we would discuss that concept of uh, what is gender, uh, gender, what is generation, and you know, things like that. So I think that was a very powerful way of uh, uh, making people sensitive. Uh, one of the tools that we use amongst various others. And then, of course, uh, a whole lot of things on uh, building uh, sensitivity within the system uh, based on exit analysis, based on interactions, based on surveys, all that we have done. The third pillar we have uh, worked on is develop. Uh, now, we have a very robust uh, learning and uh, development uh, agenda for LNT. You know, LNT is also called sometimes as learning and training. Uh, so, uh, we said that if we are going to take a set of women and, and uh, train them, we don't want them not to be eligible for other leadership development programs. So, we said let's look at the, demo let's look at the age demographics. Uh, people who are in the age of say 22 to around 32 have different set of challenges as women. People who are in the age of say 30 to 40 have a different set of challenges as women. So we build up a leadership development program on how you build in the steel within you to handle those challenges, which were very diff which had nothing to do with just pure leadership development program. So they were always eligible for that. But this specific program was very relevant to the gender and the issues you face. So in the first stage, you will face, uh, you know, you get married, you move cities, you have, you have those initial challenges of, you know, where is my career going and things like that. The second stage is more about uh, balancing, balancing your family, having the pressure of, you know, I can't handle it all and how do I go about doing it? Every time I try to do something, kuch chut jata hai, you know, that kind of mind space uh, the ladies in their 30s were. So, so specific targeted programs and then of course for the younger, uh, uh, younger lot of people, uh, for the supervisory, you know, two to three years experience people, we have something else. So very targeted programs in terms of uh, enabling them. And the fourth is what we, uh, what we call as, uh, no sorry, it is develop, that was uh, develop and enable is what we can do <coughs> with policies. 
what are the policy shifts that we need to do and along with the management every year, once in a year, we sit with them and say, what are the policy changes we are going to do to make this uh, set of people feel more included into the organization and uh, to basically handle the, the critical point that you said, you know, it's very easy to recruit actually. It's very difficult to keep them. And so, you know, so policies are required. So it's induct, engage, develop, and uh, enable. That's the framework that we have used. Wonderful. A lot of data-led interventions. The devil is in the detail, as they say. Uh, Poonam, question to you. How do you attract... Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, Vinakshi. <laughs> we've already had. A second issue highlighted by the survey is the importance of building awareness about DNI for a culture of inclusiveness and ownership to make a real difference on the ground. This is also experienced as a big reality gap that may be addressed to take workplaces to a higher trajectory. How do you get cooperation and allyship from the so-called mainstream employees? For me? Okay. Okay, so um, I have been hearing, uh, you know, different views and there are a lot of things happening in many organizations. Uh, for me, uh, when we see DNI <coughs> as a topic, uh, and I think I'm going to talk uh, pretty contrast, and that's a diversity here sitting, okay? <laughs> I'm not going to say that we need to have a strategy or we need to do this. I would say, why do we need a strategy for something as fundamental as being human? Why do we need a strategy? Why do we need scorecard? Why do we need policies? What we do in Ingram Micro is, or rather I believe, I mean, all the women who has made it to the boardroom or who has made it to any field they have all gone through all the challenges. 25 years ago, 20 years ago, we did not even talk about DNI. They had managed their kids, they have managed their family, they have managed their emotion, everything, right? Challenges were same, nothing different. So I believe that if you try to do things right at the fundamental level, where these discussions only should not happen, if a candidate whether she's a man or, I mean, whether the candidate is a man or a woman or a transgender or anybody, if he deserves, he or she deserves, has all the, you know, required capability, willingness, whatever is needed for the job, just give it. If it is a man, it's a man, it's a woman, it's a woman. I don't think I would be compromising just to tick on my DNI score, whether I have 30 women, so we are going to perform, I would rather say I have 30 competent women, so we are performing. So just by having a gender diversity, that doesn't mean you are going to have a very different uh, performance level. Are we then not doing injustice with the men? What is the happening with the 70% men? They are also equally contributing. It's not just because of the women. So my point here is DNI means, be it a woman or a man, the diversity of the thoughts, the education, the personalities, the way they dress themselves, anything and everything is a diversity. And if you are capable to do a job, irrespective of whichever degree you have or a qualification or whichever university, it should not matter. You bring that value to us, so we have hired you, so we are performing. Not because you are a woman, we are performing. That's how I see it. So I think we fundamentally work. So I'll give you a very classic example where this whole thing triggered. Policies are there. Processes are there. The leadership is talking about in every town hall, we need to do this, we need to do that, DNI, blah, blah, blah. But in spite of all that, if a large organization, if there is one hiring manager who is a man, who is interviewing a set of candidates, and there are two top finalists where there is a man and a woman, and actually with all credentials, if the woman deserves a job, she should be given the job not because she is a woman. And this man felt she is in an age where she is already recently married, she might get uh, babies, and then he is choosing a man over a woman. That's a problem for us. That's where diversity is not happening. The policies are there. Everybody knows what we are supposed to do. So if we push that person, a hiring manager, to hire a woman just to make sure that there is a woman, anyways, the experience for that woman and the hiring manager is not going to be good. So she's anyways going to quit. So I feel here you need to address the DNI, and that has to come as a culture, the way of life. It has to be a behavior change. So that's what we do, and I don't generally 
you know, focus more on policies. I would focus on behaviors and what is happening in the real reality, in the action on the shop floor. So that's, that's my opinion about Absolutely. it. Absolutely, and uh, I think this was also reflected in the CEO's pledge in the morning where, you know, one of our CEOs spoke about hiding the demographics in the, you know, list of employees and then looking at who really deserves a job. But that is a very real bias on the ground. Uh, Pallavi, you belong uh, to the business and engineering domain, but play a role as global co-lead for the women's resource group. What has been your experience about challenges for retaining talented women? So I think, first of all, I think it's been brought up a couple of times that it's very easy to hire. And we hire a lot of women at entry levels, at lower levels. The problem starts that as we progressively move up the ladder, we see the numbers dwindle. So by the time we reach the mid-senior levels or the leadership levels, the number is pretty low. Um, it's not that women don't want to be there. What we need to understand is why they don't end up there. And the root problem lies in the fact that our perception is that when it's a leadership role or when it's a supervisory role, the demands of the job are such that it requires a 24 by 7 commitment, it requires full-time attention, and with all the other priorities that we juggle, uh, they're not very sure if they want to make that kind of commitment. And that's where most women voluntarily take a step back Jump and say out. that maybe this is not where I want to be and I'm so I think organizations need to have, um, or I would say it's twofold. It's the organizations as well as home. From an organization perspective, the workplace should have a culture, like you said, where women don't feel that I have to work 10 or 12 hours just to prove myself that I'm just as good or just as competent as the other person who's sitting there and working for 10 or 12 hours. As long as I work smartly, I do my job well, and I'm good at what I'm doing, she should have that confidence in herself that, yes, I can pick up the job and I can do it. So organizations need to build that confidence within their women to be able to do that. The second piece of it is also having safe environments within organizations, like the Women's Resource Group, where they can sit together and discuss all of this, right? So I might want to talk to one of my peers who's going through a similar problem. I want might want to talk to a mentor who I might look for direction that I'm facing this particular challenge in my professional career and how do I go about solving it. So those kind of environments being made available to women is very, very important. Now coming to the home front, I think that um, the one picture that usually comes to my mind, and I think most of you must have seen it, is a woman with 10 hands and she's juggling like 10 things, a spatula, uh, a laptop, and a mobile, etc. I think it's a very wrong picture. I think that picture needs to change. We all need to change. That picture needs to have that woman standing with her husband, with her child, Absolutely. with her family members, all of them sharing that, so that the woman does not feel guilty or pressurized that I cannot prioritize my work to be able to be done, and I can leave some of my home responsibilities behind and concentrate on my work for some time. So if we have that mindset such shift within our people, like you said, DNI is more about how we are conditioned over, the, over a long period of time. If we change that mindset, I don't think any hiring manager on his own will think that I prefer the guy over the lady. It's just that inherently he'll think, oh, but what would happen if she's not available because she has to go somewhere? I would rather put my money on the guy because I know he'll be available for me whenever I need him to be there. That shift needs to happen. We need to build that confidence within ourselves and within our women population that they'll be able to do it. And we need to support them to make that happen. Thank you. Uh, Poonam, you represent the oil and gas sector and LTH caters to the entire hydrocarbon value chain. Uh, we'd like your perspective on gender stereotypes and there's a common perception that it's a male domain, you know, it's for men. How do you sort it out? How do you deal with those issues? So very interestingly, I was uh, uh, recently interacting with a French company, Total Energies, Energies okay? And... Uh, around 40 of them had come with their CEO to, uh, to interact with us. And I found a very good diversity there. So I asked them, I said that, uh, 
how much diversity do you have? They said 25 percent. I said, wow, that's damn impressive because they're also into, you know, this sector. sector. Um, so I said, how many years did it take you to reach there? They said, uh, we've still not reached there and if we've been in this since early 1990s. And then I said, what are the challenges that you're facing? They said exactly the same set of challenges that we are facing, you know. It was pretty uh, interesting to know they still have the challenges of while hiring a woman, will she get married, will she have a child, will she leave the job, will she ask for flexi time, will she not be available because she has a child's vaccination. Then we deal with the mindsets of, uh, uh, you know, men uh, still having a perception even if he's not bothered about these things, a genuine perception that a man can do this job better than the woman. And, and, and the, the usual, you know, all of that, which what we are also facing. Mm. So uh, I said, okay, how did you deal with it then? They said, you know what, we tried all these socialistic measures of, you know, trying to encourage and trying to do this and things like that. Ten years we tried it, we didn't reach much. In, uh, uh, we didn't make much success. So somewhere in... Uh, uh, early uh, 2000s, you know, 2003, 2004, uh, around that time, that's what they, they narrated to me, they finally put a KVD for everybody, key value driver. You have to have 10% women. He said that was the only way to drive it. Mm. Now, we are uh, two, three years into the journey. Uh, I am looking at their journey and uh, feeling a little good about ourselves that we are not that bad. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yes, it is, uh, it is, uh, it is a challenge, uh, but uh, uh, surprisingly, we just uh, gave an uh, All India advertisement for uh, lateral women, and you're absolutely right, you know, laterals is much difficult, and we have realized that you can't just take women at the early stage. Everybody becomes very paternalistic towards them, and that's not what you want. That's not the ideal, she's talking of, you know, uh, an ideal organization where it doesn't matter, it's very easy to take women at, uh, at the entry stage because today so many engineers for our sector, so many engineers are available. But unless you take them at all levels, the culture won't change. Mm -hmm. So we've been focusing on lateral hiring. And uh, uh, for lateral hiring, again, we had to find out positions. So we did the work on positions. Then we did a lateral hiring drive. We've done three, four drives in the last one year. And uh, we are finding people. We are finding it is not as bad as we thought. As we maybe perceive. maybe our, our standards were very low, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I'm getting a much better ROI on my advertisements than it was getting before. But then, of course, uh, it is just the first step into the whole, whole journey. You know, Then you have to integrate them. You have to do so many other things in the organization to say sustainably that uh, it is uh, going to be, it's never going to be 50-50. Uh, but, uh, okay, whatever targets we've set for ourselves, whether we will be achieving that. Okay. Uh, now we'll broaden the discussion a little bit and look at executive hiring, women back to work, or even training programs and career advancement, but across the spectrum of gender differences. Uh, companies surveyed in the IDF uh, survey, they feel that a diverse and inclusive employee base would be more competitive in a globalized economy but a lot more needs to be done in terms of policy framework and action on the ground. And less than half, 49% to be precise, they feel that their companies actually offer this support. Uh, Pallavi, my question to you, what in your opinion uh, is diversity hiring in executive teams? Does it provide a quality training for advancing career? And how do you ensure that such training and fast track options are also availed by a very diverse employee base? Or do they lose the battle in their minds because of what they perceive as the systemic bias? So I think uh, when we look at diversity hiring, especially at the executive team levels, I think it for organizations, it needs to be a more inward-looking approach. I think spotting the talent, nurturing, growing it within <coughs> the organization will yield uh, much better results than uh, having a completely uh, hiring strategy which focuses on getting that ready-made uh, kind of available talent from outside. We need to invest within the organization. It helps us in a lot of ways. First being obviously that uh, we are very intentional in finding the right set of diverse people that we want to have as part of our leadership team, obviously. 
The second is that because we, we know the people, uh, there is the less chance that we, we end up with a wrong fitment because these roles are pretty critical from an organization standpoint. Third and more importantly, for the employee on the ground, it gives a very good picture to him that what is my growth path in this organization? How will I grow? Where will my career land? And it's a big, big win for the organization in that. And I think the last and the most important thing which we need to endorse in this is that we then follow the path of reward and recognition. And it will help us find the right people within the company to be staffed in these positions. And secondly, coming to your question about trainings and uh, the fast track options. Uh, I think somebody mentioned here, right, that we have trainings, but they are very generic trainings, and then we kind of tailor them because we think that, oh, uh, I need to make a bit of change because I have a set of women who need to be kind of uh, catered to a bit differently. I think uh, that's the, the right thing to do because uh, there is a difference between equality and equity. Yes. The equity piece in, in the diversion and inclusion plays a very, very important role. So not everybody begins at the same point, right? Everybody comes from a different background. They have different challenges. So first we need to bridge the gap, and then we can have that common program that we can run across the board, right? So like we just mentioned about women, uh, in IT we have a lot of people, uh, a young crowd, right, who, who's coming from vernacular medium schools. They're not very conversant in English. They're not very self-confident about speaking. But these folks have excellent technical skills. How do we groom them to become good leaders? We need to groom them to be more assertive. How do they put their point across? All of these are coaching and leadership items that need to be part of the training program and part of the fast track options that we give. So I think depending upon the right talent that we identify, it is important that companies invest in making sure that they groom the people into the leadership. It will also help in the retention strategy for organizations. Thank you. Uh, Minakshi, what is your view, specifically coming to the training programs? Uh, you know, 82% of the respondents say that on paper, yes, equal access is provided, but what is the reality? Yeah, so I guess uh, if we, uh, again, I mean, I will just uh, repeat uh, what I have said. Training is required for everyone, right? Some people need emotional uh, kind of a support, and then you need a different kind of a mentor program for them. Some women or men or whoever, the diverse talent need technical skills, right? Just to come back to speed. If there is a sabbatical or if there's a break or just to get a job, right? I mean, to, to, to be even available for that kind of a job, you need to provide those kind of training. So I think what we do is identify what is a need. It cannot be that everybody needs the same kind of a training. Some people just need a confidence. They have the skills. They just want to come back with that speed. Provide them those sessions, right? The sessions with the counseling, some of the mentors, and some of our men, uh, you know, uh, 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 people or the leaders are also a part of these sessions. Yes. And they actually share their story also. And sometimes just whenever you have a small baby at home, a woman feels, that is the bias again, okay. that I, am, I should be available for my child if he, he, he or she is sick. Why not husband, right? Why not a father? And I think we can do this at home with our children so that in corporate we don't have to do these strategies. Mm, I agree. <laughs> True. If we re yeah, raise yeah. them together yeah. saying yes. that both of you have your life and you need to decide and you need to choose your career, I don't think we need to say, okay, vaccine, to let, uh, you know, the lady will go. And if there is an um, award function, then the man will go. I mean, come on. <laughs> so who decides this? We only decide, right? And as a woman... I should be able to tell my husband, sorry, this is an important event for me. Today, you take care of Yash. There is nothing wrong. So I think the problem is with us. Yes. We feel my mother-in-law will be unhappy. The entire society will blame me. What bad mother she is, right? Mm -hmm. It is our problem. It is not the... So I feel we should start from home, start from school, so that in corporate, the life is much better, at least for the next generation. So as a generation, it's our responsibility to make sure that we don't pass on our hidden, our uh, unconscious bias to our children. Catch them young. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, now, coming to behavior change, uh, communication, and advocacy, Rajni, you had also mentioned it in the beginning. The idea of survey respondents agree 
on two aspects. First, the value of encouraging curiosity and awareness about issues in DNI. 76% of respondents felt that building conversations around DNI was very important. 18% felt it was important, only 6% were uh, undecided. Secondly, the majority of them felt that communication campaigns around DNI need to be more focused, issue based, clear and targeted, with only 34% saying that uh, current communication is adequate. Uh, how do you maintain that momentum? Because the DNI strategy, the policy, everything is in place. What are some of the strategies to develop this ownership and you know break the our own conditioning and bias? What do you do? Right. And uh, I'm going to pick up a few things from uh, some of each one. What each one of you said because each one was uh, was delivered with so much passion and with wisdom. It was really wonderful listening to them. Uh, first, I want to pick up on what Meenakshi said, and I really loved it with the the passion with which she said it. Why should corporates be burdened with this whole piece, right? I mean, if society was doing what, or we as individuals are doing what we are supposed to do at home, then maybe we will reduce the burden in corporates. Ideal world, and yes. hopefully in the next generation. Uh, not the case today, unfortunately. Um, and therefore, I mean, while this, the ideal scenario of, uh, you know, giving the right role to the right person, agnostic of gender, is still work in progress. Um, I can say as a woman, and all of us in this panel as women, nobody will want to get a job by virtue of the fact that we are women, right? We want to be, and, and so is it with a man, with any, for, so is it with anybody for that matter. Nobody wants to be sort of, nobody wants that capability to be taken out of the consideration set. Um, but again, work in progress, unconscious biases still persist in the organization, in, in our lives, in society, in terms of expectations on women. And hence, it is important for us to put a structure in place that provides an enabling environment where all genders can flourish, where it becomes a part and parcel of the conversation, it becomes a part and parcel of the culture, both at home and, and at the workplace and in schools and colleges. Now, that's the context I'm setting. So what are we doing? Um, I'll give you some examples from a behavioral change point of view. Yes, there are targets. Yes, those are because nothing gets done if it is not measured. And, uh, but that is not a tick in the box exercise. We are very, very conscious to ensure that it is there in the DNA of the organization. And how do we do that? We do it by conscious conversations. One I want to take an example of, because see, if I look at examples um, of say mentorship, of learning programs, I really liked your cohort specific learning programs, right? Because all learning is not for everybody, cohort specific learning programs. So be it learning, be it mentorships, being, uh, be it specific career progression opportunities, every organization does it today. Is that driving the cultural change? Is that driving the behavioral shift that we want to see? Perhaps not. And hence, it is important for us to have conversations. So what do we do? We have a very structured approach. We call it disruptive conversations. We bring disruptive conversations to the table. And consciously so, these you know, conversations which make you normally squirm, uh, be it, and not only specific to gender, it is it's specific to women's issues. For example, we brought in a conversation around menopause. Yeah, uh, we brought in a conversation around period leave. We are strongly, uh, uh, you know, evaluating that. So conversations that are typically societally uncomfortable, we are trying to build it. You know, I mean, and and I was part of a meeting, international uh, audience where somebody said that, you know what, I want to take uh, 15 minutes away from this meeting and go away because my menstrual cramps are killing me. I mean, can you imagine a conversation like this? I was taken aback pleasantly, and, and I don't know. I mean, I, nobody was squirming. So I thought, well, that's something that we have achieved, at least um, in terms of establishing the fact that it's OK. It's OK to be what you are. It's OK to be whichever gender you are, to be evaluated for who you are, number one. Number two, in terms of women, again, coming back to women and women in leadership, uh, the point that Pallavi, you mentioned about confidence of women, right? I mean, that's 
that's something that women need to build in themselves. And, and uh, studies have established that women are normally not so confident or normally not so upfront in terms of demanding what is rightfully due to them, in terms of negotiating salaries, in terms of seeking promotions, in terms of being seen as ready for the next role. They don't. They are, they don't. So how do we build this capability and confidence for women to kind of put up their hands? And so we have cohorts. We, you have cohort-based training. We have employee resource groups, which are cohort-specific. For example, we have a new moms group. I'm sure many organizations have it. They draw in, they lean in on each other, they learn, they share. It's a safe space for people to talk. Again, it's a conversation. The theme is on conversations. How are you building conversations? So we have a teenagers group. Been there, done that, kids are uh, going away, empty nesters, don't know what to do. My God, existential, uh, you know, quandary. So they draw from each other, right? I mean, and it is, it's natural. So my point is driving behavior change, driving culture change is not a simple thing. It is not a tick in the box. It cannot be achieved by metrics. Metrics, of course, are necessary. Metrics and targets are necessary to start and set the course and check in on whether we are doing the right things and are in the right path. But it takes continuous reaffirmation, continuous reaffirmation. We are involved in you know, external impact as well. We have a foundation, um, and our foundation is very young. It's just two years old, but we are working externally with a lot of partners. And the focus for our foundation externally is equipping women for life. And we bring in our employee resource groups, all genders, all genders. It's, it's agnostic of genders, gender, to kind of make a social impact so that people can take this learning and take this kind of awareness beyond what it is within the organization. So it's, it's a work in progress, but I think we are making good progress. So that's, that's what I want to table. Work in progress and uh, the sense that I'm getting from whatever we've been listening to is that organizations are, you know, they're evolving into living, breathing spaces. And it's not about, uh, just about, of course, Excel sheets are important, but it's not just about the, the bottom line. It's about creating the safe space, bringing those support groups into, uh, because we all spend the majority of our, uh, you know, uh, lives in our organizations. Um, Can I add one point? Yes, please, please. So, uh, you know, International Women's Day has become so celebrated these days, mm -hmm. and so much. And generally, you find the men saying, Ki kya hai? you know? <laughs> so what we did uh, this year is, uh, I don't know, do, does anybody know that there's an International Men's Day? Yes, yes. 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 19th November. <laughs> November, yeah. So we celebrated International yes. Men's Day and International we uh, Men's Day Week. So like when you do for a Women's Day, there are sessions on on problems that women face, we, we picked up sessions on problems that men face, you know, hair loss, prostate cancer, and things like that. So we picked up those topics, we kept the same doctor speeches and everything, and that day we did a lot of uh, fun and games with them, the, the way we do on Women's Day, just to, uh, you know, for the inclusion part of it. And, and it was summed up so beautifully by a guy uh, when he was giving us feedback. Uh, I'll say it in Hindi the way he said it, and I will repeat it in English. So he says, uh, uh, lagta tha wo, you know, International Men's Day, hum bolte the, ek din tumhara, baaki din hamare. That is like, I didn't like what you were, were with, with this International Women's Day. So I should say, okay, okay, one day yours, rest of the day is mine. Now that you've celebrated International Men's Day, he said, ek din tumhara, ek din hamara, baaki din hum sabke. And I think that summed up the inclusion very beautifully. And you know, in our efforts, what very, we were doing. Very, very, very inspiring. Can I just add one last point on that? I won't take time, I know. Uh, men's Day, Women's Day. Do you know there is an International Transgender Day? Yes. yes. OK, great. That was on 31st of March. And we celebrated that as well, because our approach is neutrality of gender. It doesn't matter. It just <coughs> doesn't matter. It's OK for you to be who you are. It's OK for you to be doing what you do, as long as we can all come together, collaborate, and, and sort of win together. So Bring all of you to work. Don't yeah. leave anything behind. Don't hide anything. Uh, now, connected to all of this is the idea of hybrid and flexi work, uh, which we all learned about during COVID times. Now, this was one of the segments of our survey. And we also this was also a question, original question in our 2021 survey. Now, in 21, 
respondents had said an emphatic yes to flexi work, hybrid modes, enthusiasm all across the board. Uh, of course, at that time, there was a complaint about the implementation gap and you know, about non-verbal cues going to people who wanted uh, flexi and hybrid work. In 2023, respondents were a lot less sure about the effectiveness of hybrid work. Only 46% agreed that hybrid work does not pose challenges to productivity, cohesion, and discipline. 12% felt that hybrid work is a challenge to productivity, while a large chunk, about 30%, were undivided. So the enthusiasm and the per perceived effectiveness of hybrid and flexi work is actually going down if you compare it with the first survey. Um, Ajanta, I'll bring you in here. Uh, what, is, what is, and also manufacturing as a sector, what is right. your perception, <clears throat> what has been your journey over, especially over the past three years? Yeah, so um, before I go on to the hybrid work, a little bit on the manufacturing sector and where we are in the DEI journey. It's not a, an easy place. And I kind of say things with a lot of cautious and being very conscious about it. One thing I truly believe, that the organizations are a reflection of the society that we live in. Doesn't matter what we individually think, at the end of the day, large part of the employees come from the society, from where they are coming. And that is reflection on the household, their education, their upbringing. Yeah. And hence, with the ESG coming in big today, ESG is all about environment. There is also a social and governance part of it. So we as an organization, if we can also reflect back on the society from where we come in and start the change from there. Because organization in isolation doesn't work. Manufacturing, flip it. We are not in the cities. We are in tier two, tier three towns where with large factory set up, right? Including women there setting up in the careers where, uh, you know, industry like ours, traditionally, it has been men-driven. And today, while you all may be doing it for the last so many, so many years, I think we are talking about diversity today. Because the industry has grown multifold with the kind of uh, demography that it had. The, the business numbers came in. It is, it is a very, very successful business. So how do you then slowly seep in the idea of diversity to these very successful business leaders who had led business in a certain way and then seen success, right? So it's a very different kind of story for us. Now coming to hybrid work, how many of you all have worked on factory shop floors in this, right? Does work from home work? <laughs> no. So that is the point. It is the kind of work that you are in, and I think everything starts from there. If you're at a factory shop floor, hybrid work doesn't work. Work from home doesn't work. You have to come to your factory every day to get the work done. So work from home goes away. Then it comes the flexible work. Again, 95% of JSW group workforce it is at the factories and at our plants. Then there's a shift. Everybody has to come at a designated shift because if you're not doing that, then the machines won't run. And once you leave, then the next person comes in. So flexibility of work on what we think sitting in Bombay or in corporate office doesn't work. That's the reality for any industry of factory workers or plant workers. So how do we ensure that there is a sense of flexibility and hence discretion of the employees to take time off to come or be a little bit of flexibility in during the shift timings comes in. So for me, hybrid and flexibility of work comes from the nature of work yeah. you are in. If you are in emergency works like the police or hospital, I don't know if they are talking about hybrid or flexibility at this point <laughs> of time, right? So, uh, so against the nature of work, the nature of service, where you are working, and then the whole thing. And again, uh, since you mentioned pan pandemic, for all of us here who thinks hybrid and flexibility, just think about what was your work situation before pandemic? How did your organization work then? And if your organization worked in a certain way, trust me, it will go back to those days. Yeah, because that was a steady state, and that's the way the organization had seen success, right? Pandemic was an aberration. 
So that's from me, from, yes, the, from, uh, the, yeah, from the hybrid and flexibility part of Can it. Can I add something? I think I'll bring in the panel, absolutely. So yeah. go yeah. ahead. Because I have a different perspective because we yeah. come from IT and uh, when we came up with this whole flexi work and hybrid and work from home, IT probably was the biggest industry that yeah. applauded the change because we felt that, uh, yeah, this is what we want to do. Um, our company, we, we changed to a remote first policy uh, when the pandemic came in and essentially right now also we're still in a remote first policy because we believe that because we've rolled out the policy and we've made it available to folks we've allowed them to work from whatever location they want to work so it it's it's not mandatory for people to come into office and work uh, it's their discretion on whether or not they want to come into office and work but what we've seen over the past few months post the pandemic is that People like to come together and work. They mm -hmm. like working in teams. Interaction, the human interaction piece that was missing during the two-year time frame where everybody was working at home and was working remotely, they actually prefer coming into office at least for a day or so just to be able to see their colleagues, just to be able to have those cooler side conversations. They enjoy that piece of it. They enjoy the camaraderie that comes with it. So I think right now at least from an IT industry space we like the hybrid and the flexi work options um, we like the remote work but we still want our offices to still be there for us to be able to come in and do the work that we want to do especially for women I think uh, I, f I feel uh, I see more women in office now than I saw earlier because I think they like coming into offices more because it provides them with that focus at home, they are a bit more distracted, if I may say so myself. Uh, when they're working from home, they prefer the work environment that's in offices. So I see more women in offices now. May I add? Yeah. So we are, uh, we are doing hybrid. We're working two days out of five. Um, and uh, we moved from a scenario where uh, uh, work from home was considered taboo. I mean, not because we didn't have it. We had work from home pre-COVID uh, pre as well. But uh, managers were not very comfortable because you know it is this whole point of trust is also uh, fundamental uh, when you're working remote, right? So then we moved 100% remote as did most organizations through the pandemic, and we're back in a, a hybrid uh, format. But I agree with what Pallavi said, uh, and I and, and what you said also, Ajanta, because there is a certain there are certain roles which need to be performed or which are performed best when you're in office, which are performed best when you're in a team. We work with a whole range of uh, our clients across FMCG to banking to new age startups. And if we are delivering a project, the team has to sit together. There is a creative process of discussion and follow through that happens that cannot happen remote. So there are certain mandates around, uh, there are certain advantages of doing that. But a hybrid gives you that psychological comfort that it's okay that, yeah. uh, you know, if you're not, if you're not there. That is from an individual standpoint. From an organizational standpoint, um, we are facing the challenge that, you know, we take in um, campus recruits a fair number um, every year. Now, these are freshers, young kids who have no corporate, mostly don't have corporate experience. How are you going to give them how are you going to inculcate the culture of the organization in them if they are going to be remote? So it is important for them to be physically there. And a lot of development, particularly at a youngster level, happens when you're in office. You're seeing other people work. Your behavior gets shaped by what you see. So we are actually kind of playing around with it a little bit. Uh, while we're not mandating it, um, we are saying that you know if you're a new recruit, you know it's better for you to come in for at least for the first few uh, weeks, months, etc. So you get the flavor. Training programs are done in person, uh, so you imbibe the spirit of the whole place. Um, and uh, yes, I agree with you also, Pallavi, that um, uh, people do prefer because there are less distractions at work, agnostic of gender again. Um, and yeah, um, so so we are playing around with it. There is a benefit of hybrid. But there is a distinct advantage. At the end of the day, we are all social animals. We like interaction. We like physical interaction. We can't sit at home in front of a screen the whole day through. Um, these little water cooler conversations or little asides or little gossips, I mean, they keep us going. Right, so, <laughs> yeah, they keep us going. Yeah, so, the other day, yes. my son uh, made a comment to me saying that for the past two years, I felt like you were working in a call center where you had your head yeah, yeah, yes. all the time and you were yeah. talking on phone the entire time. And it feels good to see you go out of 
uh, home and go into the office <laughs> a lot more than you did earlier. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, I, I have uh, gender and generation uh, right at my house. I have two daughters. One is a lawyer and one is a chartered accountant. Uh, I also work in an industry like yours in construction and you can't do it from sitting from home. Right. Uh, so one thing choice that they have made is uh, unfortunately for people like us that we will not get into your industry only. <laughs> <laughs> so you know we would be actually yeah. losing out on a whole talent and that's a big challenge for yeah. us on how do we do it. Then I when I you know they also during COVID they were at home and then they've gone back. I think what they are asking for is a simple term of flexibility. I think they love their offices. They have, uh, uh, you know, somebody has a structured, one of them has a structured one day a week you can be at home. The other one has a very, very flexible, you know, how many ever days. I find both of them, uh, what is their choice when they get up in the morning is to go to work. Uh, but they like the fact that they have that flexibility. Yeah, it's so this, gen this younger generation is all about having a choice, you know. When yes. with, with Swiggy, you know, our, our lives have been made easy. But uh, choice has become so integral to the generation that uh, it is extremely important for organizations to and very difficult for industries like her and mine uh, on, you know, uh, how are we going to then attract uh, this, uh, this generation. Yeah. Yeah, I guess all points are covered. I don't want to repeat, but I think more than having a hybrid policy or remote work, flexibility is important yeah. is what we are actually, you know, we realized. Uh, and again, based on all experiences and we see it day in, day out, people who work, they work from anywhere. And people who don't, they will not even work in office. <laughs> well <laughs> So, for that, it doesn't matter, right? I mean, so long you deliver, I don't care where you are, right? So, this is about, this is not about work-life balance, it's about work and life, because you can't put them in silos. That's probably what's, and the flexibility, the choice uh, has to rest with all of us, each of us. That brings us to the end of the questions that we had. There's just one more area that the survey threw up, and uh, if there is time, I'd like to take everybody's views on it, and this is about the age bias. In uh, the 21 edition of the survey, only 22% companies hired at least 5% under 50. This figure is up. In 23, 30% of companies have hired 5% under 50. Everybody's experience. Age gap? 5% under 50. Over 50. Over 50. Over 50. Over 50. Over 50. Yes. Over 50 start with you. Uh, okay. So um, we have a specific movement uh, within Kantar uh, on age no bar, um, as with all movements internally. So we have a, uh, a global employee resource group, which is actually working on uh, you know, ways of um, removing gender biases in terms of, uh, again, culture of the organization. Uh, obviously, we are across multiple countries, so you know questions around uh, retirement, etc., is uh, based on the law of the land. Um, so, but we are very, very uh, conscious about uh, about unconscious biases on age. So, uh, so we have started the conversations. We have put in place, uh, you know, the necessary structures where you know at the time of hiring, uh, we we do not discuss age. Uh, I mean, we prohibited from discussing age. Um, and at the time of, uh, I mean, at the time of every uh, people movement, be it a promotion or whatever, age is not a, should not be a criterion. We are conscious that, that, that there is unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. And hence this conversation and these global employee resource groups around removing the biases on, um, on age. Uh, that's where we are. The one point I want to place on the table also is that there is also a financial implication to the whole, um, this, not that we are doing the financial discussion, but there is a financial implication because when there is a continuity beyond a certain defined age, then there is organizational uh, cost implication in terms of retirals, in terms of coverage, etc., which maybe organizations are factoring in as well. Um, so in that sense, there is a real financial implication, uh, but the fact remains that uh, in the interest of no discrimination, and we are talking about inclusion and equality and equity, um, 
age is a key piece that needs to be looked into in terms of removing the bias. That, that's my submission. I think we are lucky. We don't discuss age. I mean, it's, it's the role, your suitability for the role. I'm very happy to realize that somewhere we are really benchmarking DEI. <laughs> <laughs> Many places we are struggling, but uh, interesting to know that we are benchmarked. It's, it's just your competence and that's all that matters in our organization. Uh, I agree with you uh, for most part. I think for most part age is never a criteria of discussion when we hire somebody for the role. But often <coughs> I've heard conversations around tables where we say that uh, if we have a person above a certain age, is he going to gel with the rest of the population around them? Will they have the same thought process, the same mindset for them to be able to work with the rest of the people who belong to a certain age group? So I don't think it is intentional about not hiring people above a certain age. Um, but at the same time, uh, like you mentioned, there are implications to having people uh, beyond a certain age a part of the organization, IT organizations, especially in India, are pretty young uh, by those standards. So we generally don't have a lot of problem where we find a lot of population that's uh, close to retirement age, etc. those kind of issues. But I think uh, age is not intentional. As of now, I have not seen it to be that intentional. Uh, it's just, a, I think, a statistic that's being true. So for us, I guess, uh, age uh, is wisdom. Uh, you bring your age, not really your age, but you bring your energy. So if you are, I mean, I have seen so many senior leaders who are 55, 56, giving genuine, uh, you know, competition competition to people are in early 30s. So they are, you know, better than, you know, better in energy, the activity, the overall taking initiatives. So I think we would focus more on energy and the value addition you do versus, uh, you know, what is your age. So age is never discussed. If you deserve a job, it is given. And we also have a reverse mentoring. Mm. So even we have some of the youngsters and uh, the, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the age is wisdom people, we have a club. They come together and discuss each other and then teach each other what they would like to Wonderful. learn. So I think that helps. But again, as I said, you bring energy, nobody cares about your age. So at JSW, it is pretty much on uh, internal talent uh, growing uh, to the top leadership. So our external versus internal uh, development is around 90-10. So it's only 10% who comes from outside. Um, and those are for the critical roles and experience and the capability decides. Uh, and mainly, we hire GETs. So that is absolutely the young branch. But it is pretty much a 90% of the employees who are growing into their roles. So, age is not uh, discussed. Yeah. I just want to add on one last point. See, India is demographically a young country, right? Mm -hmm. We know it. So therefore, I don't think we will have a lot of instances where people are moving towards retirement or it becomes a problem for us to handle. But uh, the question is, in the true spirit of removing age discrimination, I mean, will organizations abolish the whole concept of retirement age? Can be a moot question, because many countries don't have retirement age, but we do. I mean, we have a range between 55 and 65, anywhere between 55, depending on organizations. Will the industry stop having retirement as a concept? I think that's, that's what will define whether there is discrimination or not.